Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, I'm joined by Raja Verganathan to discuss his recent paper looking at individual differences in motor learning. How effectively can we predict differences in the ability of individuals to learn a new motor skill? What are the best predictor variables? What work do we need to do to do better research in this area? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. All right. Welcome back. Uh, return guest a few times, Rajiv. Good to see you again. Uh, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks, Rob. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be back. Um, why I wanted to talk about you this time is is you have an article. I think it's an, it's, it's still under review, right? It's preprint. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were looking at the really interesting question of how well we can predict how well someone can learn motor learning tasks, right? And, you know, if I put this in a sports context, you know, coaches will talk about kids being very coachable or like a sponge. Everyone recognizes there's different difference, individual differences in how well people learn motor skills. But can we actually predict <laughs> um, who will be better? And so is that kind of... Um, I know you've done yourself some work in this area, right? So kind of what kind of motivated you to dig into this question? So it was kind of, you know, I, I, there have been a few few papers on individual differences in motor learning. And, you know, it's always one of those things where, you know, you have a spread of data you maybe want to see. It's like, you know, what makes you know, this person in the group different from that? And so like even when you're doing sort of typical group studies, you know, there's always, you know, a couple of correlation plots that show, Hey, you know, people in this group, if you had this characteristic, you seem to benefit mostly from this practice, whereas if you had this other characteristic, you know, so it's always been used as a way of, you know, explaining some more of the variance uh, in the data. And and we we had um we had sort of one project that we were recently doing where, you know, we were sort of getting to the completion of this and we were trying to compare it to some other results. And, you know, of course, everything was was mixed as usual. And so at that point, I kind of thought about, okay, maybe we should, you know, try and do a quick lit review in terms of like what's out there in terms of um, these ability to predict individuals. I mean, there's individual differences is sort of like one of those terms that seems to be used in very different contexts. Um, So like, like we were really interested in this idea of can you predict sort of ahead of time what's going to happen, mm-hmm. not sort of like what changes along with learning is sort of like a different type of approach, uh, but but really thinking about sort of, you know, can you can you predict the future to some extent? Um, so that's that's what sort of started the the whole process. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I almost think of, I keep relating it back to sports. I almost think it is like, like it's a merging of talent ID and talent development, right? Almost in a way it's like, you know, we've been so focused on talent ID by looking at the, you know, certain trying to like to combine or draft in sports for, but here you're trying to predict who's going to learn, develop the best in a way, which is a really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So you, um, so to force out, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're going to train someone in a motor skill, the type of motor skills used is, is an issue you, you, you raise, um, and then see if we can, well, we're first going to measure something and then predict well, how well, uh, people will learn it. And talk like, wh- I know there seems to be a lot of different predictor variables people have tried to use. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so so the goal was, I mean, there have been, there have been a lot of really good articles in terms mm-hmm. of reviews and, you know, sort of looking at theories, that kind of stuff. So we, we kind of just went very uh, sort of low level on this one and say, okay, now let's just look at, you know, what are things that people have used to predict? Mm-hmm. And so we, um, you know, we came up with a rough, you know, two bins of, you know, either it's a behavioral variable or it's a sort of brain related variable because there were lots of studies on um, using neuroimaging of some some kind, whether it's EEG data, sometimes fMRI, sometimes it's like structural brain mm-hmm. imaging data. So there were lots of sort of uh, work on that. So you kind of put it in two, two big bins mm-hmm. uh, and then try to look at, you know, in each of these papers. And again, we started roughly at 2000, sort of about 20 years uh, off papers. And we were looking for, you know, what, what, what things have people used? And, and what we found uh, surprisingly to some extent is that um, behavioral and neural were, were roughly about 50-50 almost mm-hmm. um, in the sense of there's almost equal number of papers in either bin. Um, what surprised us more was the number of papers that try to predict using variables that are not related to task performance okay. is okay. almost like three to one. So you, you would think... <laughs> to some extent, if you're like a specificity type of person, right, you would think your initial performance at the task should be sort of like, you know, your best predictor of how well you're going to do it. Um, but, you know, maybe you can think of it another way. Maybe it's not novel enough, right? I mean, yeah, that you'd expect that. So a lot of these papers uh, tended to use something that was was not related to the task, you know, even if it's a behavioral variable, you know, maybe it's like, like working memory or... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, related to, like I said, if you're a neuroimaging person, maybe it's related to, you know, this fractional anisotropy, you know, measure, mm-hmm. which is sort of like a structural type measure. Mm-hmm. And so we were, we, we were kind of surprised by the fact that there were a lot more papers um, trying to predict these sort of the, the learning uh, based on variables that were not related to directly to the task. Yeah. Yeah, so in the behavior ones, are were the things like reaction time and gen, like simple yeah, like reaction time. Yeah, variability was, was yeah. popular. I think um, there there was this um, Nature Neuroscience paper, you know, I, I think almost a decade ago now, mm-hmm. uh, looking at this sort of idea of predicting learning using variability. Um, so a lot of papers sort of picked up on that uh, theme, and so there was variability was was big. Um, then we had all the the EEG functional connectivity that kind of measures uh, mm-hmm. tended to be pretty big as well, and then you had a whole bunch of sort of other mixed ones. So like you know, like I said, working memory was one. Mm-hmm. There was you know, muscle strength, reaction time, those kinds of things. So, so, all, so all, all, all all over the all over the place. So if we were you know if we were putting this in a theoretical, would you know these are individual constraints? Maybe uh, some of them, I guess, are. Some of them are a bit more than that. Maybe <laughs> uh, they're getting into a task, task almost. But yeah, yeah. No, that that's yeah, really, yeah. yeah. I think you could you could argue these are primarily individual. Um, yeah. I guess although some of them are in the context of a particular task, but yeah, yeah. So the so you're so these are all studies that were trying to pre, they measured these pre training and tried to predict the one. Yeah. Right. And then um, so. So if I, and then the tasks used, I think most part they're very were very simplified uh, motor tasks. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I, I guess we weren't too surprised by yeah. this. I mean, visual motor adaptation and sequence learning, at least in the mm-hmm. sort of traditional motor learning world, have have been pretty dominant. I think in the last two decades. So so we weren't surprised. But I think what did catch us a little bit of surprise was like almost the absence of pretty much anything else uh, which mm-hmm. and and I think it also makes sense given some of the other things that that people are measuring like if you're thinking about measuring you know brain activity when you're doing this mm-hmm. you know it's going to be hard to do lots yeah. of lots of motor tasks while you're in a scanner so uh, the fact that some of these kind of are constrained by what you're trying to measure um, I think also determine that you know these are going to be sort of these you know sequence learning tasks which you can tap uh, while your brain is being scanned, that kind of stuff. So I, I think part that was, like I said, I think that we weren't surprised that adaptation and sequence learning would be popular, but mm-hmm. maybe not to the degree that we found. I think you know, maybe like 10% was not. With something one. else. Yeah. 
And is do you include like your work and the work that Carl's done on in this group, or you? Uh, it's it's a good question. So th this is one thing we were really um, like at the time of trying to do it. We were trying to see what, how do we classify whether a study is about individual differences and about prediction, mm -hmm. and, and because we wanted to kind of have some common metric of comparison, we we chose you know sort of that it had to report some kind of Pearson correlation okay. uh, between the dependent and the independent variable, because that seemed to be pretty common where we could have a decent set of papers, but uh, that also meant that certain kinds of papers, like, you know, pe uh, papers that use, for example, like cluster analysis to kind of mm -hmm. divvy up the studies, you know, or the individuals into different small clusters, those didn't uh, get included. Um, and I know Carl's done a couple of those um, and lots of others have mm -hmm. well, as well done these things. So so it was not necessarily to kind of exclude those studies, you know, intentionally. I think it was more about, you know, how can we have some uniformity within the studies where we could kind of, you know, plot them on the same axis and say, okay, what's what's really going on in terms of how good um, the prediction is. And so that's that's what we did. So um, I believe, if my memory story is right, uh, I I didn't include my own studies. On, and I had a couple, I think, on individual differences mm -hmm. before. So I have I didn't include those uh, because they were sort of post hoc. Um, even, even studies where they, uh, you know, they came up with like a, if it was a, say, a median split and said, okay, I'm going to compare the people who didn't do so well versus the people who did so well and did a sort of t-test or anno or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we didn't include those um, because they sort of tend to exaggerate the differences when you're taking right. a continuous measure and sort of splitting it. So we, you know, some of those studies also got um, excluded. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I was I was thinking. You're you're kind of you're we were you trying to get like a common effect size measure almost. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that's so if, like one of the things that you know was was most striking was this inverse relation between the sample size and the correlation, the effect size. Right? Okay. So the, the the smaller studies tend to report you know correlations upwards of like 0.8. Okay. Uh, and then as you get bigger and bigger, you know, they sort of come down almost to like the point, point, <laughs> four, point four range. Um, and, and this is, this finding itself <laughs> was not new um, in the sense that there's a, there's a previous paper, like in the 2009 uh, by, by Wool and Pashler, they were looking at this idea in terms of, um, um, uh, Thing they call social social neuroscience. So it's sort of okay. like looking at you know, can you predict walking speed using those kinds of you know mm -hmm. uh, some kind of behavioral measure and th things like that. And and they found almost the exact same uh, result. And you know, it was kind of stunning to see how close it was in terms of the you know, if you have sample sizes under like twelve or twelve or so, your correlations in a sense really? have be really big to be significant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like these, um, in, in, one, in one way it makes sense because only if it's that strong is it even probably going to make it through the, the significance filter. Right. Um, and, and there has been a lot of discussions on that paper on terms of, you know, why that happens. Um, but I think, yeah, it was just kind of stunning to see the same, same effect in, in motor learning studies. Yeah, that that's really interesting. Yeah. I guess you know, uh, you know, from other, it, it, you kind of you have to be very cautious of a a high effect size with low power, right? <laughs> it really makes wor people worry right now that we understand that relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I would say, I, even like maybe three, four years back, if if it was if it was a small sample size and I got a correlation of whatever point eight. You know, my initial sense would be, well, this this can't be chance, right? Or this yeah, same here. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, since then, I think <laughs> yeah, I've grown a little bit wiser. That, <laughs> yeah, uh, we understand. You know? Yeah, I was exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like you know, I didn't need to run more because you know, uh, you know, there right. were. It was like, wow, there must be something if I can get it. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. And this also made me think. I know. I think you have at least one other paper, right, where you. You're starting to kind of 
address the problem of the kind of inconsistency and in methodology in motor learning, right? right. It, how hard it is to compare stuff because we're using such different tasks, different number of participants. Was that part of Because that seems like it's going on here in here this as well, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's one of the... One of the feelings I, I got out of it, and this is now me personally, not on, mm. the, not on the co-authors, um, mm. but but really thinking about, you know, can we continue to keep doing single lab mm -hmm. studies on some topics in motor learning, right? I mean, I mean psychology in some, to some degree has sort of, you know, after the, the, the famous replication crisis have, mm. have, have gone to other types of things where you know, they'd have to increase their sample. Like, well, it's, you know, online data collection to some extent can can do that. Um, but they've also got these things like the um, the psychological science accelerator, right? Which is sort of mm. these big consortia of labs that decide to do one thing. And then, you know, the, it, the, the sample size is times, whatever, mm. all these labs working on the same project. Um, to some degree, I think, Again, doesn't have to be for everything in motor learning. I want to qualify mm -hmm. that. But I think for some topics like individual differences, I think fits that criteria. Um, there really needs to be a more concerted effort across groups of you know, investigators. I don't think this is going to be solved by you know, the, the same single PI model uh, where you know one person does the research and publishes it, it's kind of getting to the point where you know, as, as you know, like I said, the, the sample size issue. Well, okay, you could really try very hard and get more, right? That's mm -hmm. that's certainly doable. But once, say, you add these neuroimaging type measures, uh, it also becomes expensive. And so, you know, the, the fact that somebody can run these kinds of studies on their own. Um, you know, also puts constraints on lots of other resources as well. So I, I really think trying to kind of, like you mentioned, trying to find some kind of standards in terms of, okay, this would be a good task to do for individual differences. You know, here's here's what the, you know, the task looks like if you learn it for, you know, X number of days, whatever it is. If, if we have those sorts of data, then I think it's sort of helpful in terms of trying to bring these studies together rather than everybody sort of do, you know, slightly different variations of the same thing. And then when they don't match, we sort of dump it on the task and you know, yeah. say it, it's because the task is different sort of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. It's been interesting. I think almost like the, the replication crisis really hasn't got the same attention in sports science and motor learning, largely because... I think for with a few exceptions, we don't replicate anything at all. Yeah. So nobody notices, <laughs> like other than block versus random at focus of attention. But even those aren't pure replications. They're new tasks, testing it. Like, so no one notices that <laughs> things don't replicate because we don't try usually. Um, but I agree with you, especially, you know, the, some of these things would be so easy to s establish a battery of pretests and right. a battery of measures, yeah. even if we weren't using the same tasks. It, they're so easy to, to, a lot of things are very easy to measure. We could all be doing the same ones, <laughs> right? right. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I agree. It, it, it's a problem and, you know, and especially when you, you know, when you get into more complex tasks, like, um, I know, like, like, I'm sure you would say about the same about like your baseball VR studies, like it's right. almost unreplicable, isn't it? Right. Cause <laughs> it, it was like a, you're trying Nobody's to do something. Do yeah, Mine too. Yeah. Most of my simulation ones, like, right. cause it's like a one of a kind setup. <laughs> right. Like, I don't think I could tell someone the details. Like, obviously the methods are supposed to have enough in there, but you know, right. it, it wants you get complex. So, so that, so, yeah. but I thought of that cause I know you are kind of bringing that issue up in, in other areas. So. Yeah. That, it's sort of, a, you know, I, I think in two points, I think one, I agree with the idea, you know, like in sports science or motor learning, mm -hmm. you know, the task is, is part of what we want to understand. Right. So, mm -hmm. so we don't, we see the task as sort of a feature, not a bug sort of thing. So mm -hmm. when things are different with two different tasks. We, we kind of, go you know we don't say they are not replicable we're like oh what about these tasks you know maybe it's, this works for discrete tasks and this works for continuous tasks whatever mm -hmm. right we we have now another uh 
another dimension to explain these differences, you know, because, you know, the task is, is pretty all powerful in terms of what you can come up with in terms of trying to distinguish the two. Um, the other thing in terms of these standardization, I think in terms of tasks, um, is I think it provides some sort of um, happy medium between everybody doing their own thing versus mm -hmm. like this this sort of the other type of thing where like, you know, everybody's either studying adaptation or sequence learning, right? So you sort of have these two extremes where you're either limited in terms of what kinds of things you study versus, you know, everybody's just studying their own. So having, you know, maybe it's like whatever, three or four tasks, right? Which, which are, so I say, okay, if, if, you're, if you're doing adaptation, this is your standard task. And um, that way, then we could sort of look at things more carefully, I think, in terms of, you know, I always think about like comparing the results directly, not just comparing trends between studies, right? Mm -hmm. So can I compare my, you know, error that I get after four days of learning to somebody else's right now, the answer is, is almost no, right? Because it, it, there's no way my dependent variable matches anybody else's. Yeah. The task matches. And so trying to find some way of building on other people's work, I think requires some level of, um, of standardization. Yeah, I think that's a great point you, you make. I think uh, you're right. It's either the when people use the same thing, it's oversimplified and we complain that's not coordination. It's not right. Or they go, I'm going to study rowing and build my one of a kind rowing simulator. Right. Uh, you're right. There, there's no middle. <laughs> you're right. You're right. That, that's a great point. So, so, um, so you to get back to your study. So you met, you looked at these studies, kind of what, did you let's get in some of the things you found about how well people c can predict the motor learning? Yeah, I mean the first yeah. thing I think you talked a little bit about yeah. the, the the predictor variables, right? Mm -hmm. That that's quite a oh yeah, a get, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, <laughs> that was also surprising <laughs> to us is like what people use as def, you know variables for learning, right? I mean we've okay. got sort of the standard what we call the the level of learning, right? Where you got after the end of practice was you know sort of one way, but um, a lot of people did like change scores, right? How much did you change from the baseline? Mm -hmm. and, and some of them were like percentage change scores. <laughs> and some of them were like rates of learning, you know, quantified with an exponential. And some of them were like, whatever, rates of learning quantified with power laws. And, and again, this is not to say all these tasks are going to have the same thing and they should use the same variable. Uh, but this is where I think, you know, going back to, again, some of the, the recent work in psych, you know, trying to do some sorts of, pre-registrations of these decisions can help improve the transparency around them, right? So so that it doesn't sound like, well, I just tried a bunch of things and, you know, reported the one that was significant, you know, sort mm -hmm. of having, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe this task does require a power law or maybe this task does require an exponential to describe its thing. But having a pre-registration associated with it, I think would make that study much more powerful um, rather than sort of feel like that was something that was done post hoc because some other thing did not uh, work out. Yeah, good good point. I think a common one I, I probably done myself, right? You you do a motor learning study and you, you have a big pretest difference. So yeah. you 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 essentially oh, I'm going to calculate change scores and then it gets hidden that there was a pretest difference, but it's which is important to report, right? right? Um things like that, yeah. Um, cause yeah, I think I agree that I've had some, you know, over the years, people argue about why, you know, none of those are any better than the other. I don't think, you know, people are kind of argue there's certain ones that everybody uses, but you're right. You have to have some rationale other than that's the one that worked, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's a great point. So, so there was a lot of data. So you, uh, as you say, you were trying to, uh, your main thing you're trying to do is look at the core people were correlating, whatever predictor variable with the chain score or the exponent or, or it, and yeah. you're trying to look at those. Yeah. What did you find when you, you kind of looked at those? Well, I, I think the main thing from that is just the, the fragmentation as in mm -hmm. the, even for what you would think are similar types of studies, um, the, you know, what they define as learning in terms of either the predictor or the predicted variable never matches up, even though again, the, the correlations were pretty high. Mm -hmm. But they didn't seem to always correlate the same types of variables, mm -hmm. uh, which, again, seems to kind of, you know, it's not something that I would say is very uh, 
helpful or, or promising mm-hmm. in terms of establishing a very solid uh, base of evidence. Mm-hmm. The, the other one, like I said, you, you know, we kind of looked at what's the strength of the correlation itself. And that, again, went down the more sample sizes started to get bigger. And, and so that, too, was sort of not very uh, promising in terms of, like, you know, what are we finding here? Are these, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, um, flukes to some extent in terms of what the data is showing or, you know, how do we sort of compile all this evidence together is kind of, it's hard to do it when you have results like that. Yeah. No, that's really um, yeah, a good point. <laughs> Such a mix. It, it didn't, so I noticed you did, you looked at uh, 20, last 20 years, right? 2000 to, is some of this, is there some of this in, you know, the classic, is it Henry work, like perceptual motor abilities? I don't know if they did training those, didn't they? They did training studies or as much trying to correlate like reaction time with eye-hand coordination. Like, 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 yeah, there's the yeah. Intra, intra-task correlation yeah. that they did sort of like, I think that's the classic specificity work. Yeah. Um, but but I've, I've seen a lot of Henry studies looking at um, individual differences in terms of things like this too, in terms of whether... Uh, performances tend to converge over time or or diverge over time. So if you mm-hmm. look at you know a group of individuals, you take that to, take them at baseline. You know are they are they diverging or are they converging? And even there, I think they had the same kind of results where you know like some other investigator found that they diverge, and you know if you mm-hmm. chose a different task, then they converge. And obviously, this depends on what your dependent variables like, right? I mean, if your dependent variables saturating, then people mm-hmm. are almost by definition going to converge uh, because there's no no room for improvement anymore. Yeah. Uh, but if you're sort of like, and, and again, this is where I think, you know, it's rather than trying to kind of say, oh, why did this task show differences this way versus that way? If you had a common task that that you know the learning curve, then you've got a much better sense for Oh yeah, because you know these guys are almost at the end of the learning curve, so you know they're going to mm-hmm. converge. It's not any anything unique to the task that's doing it. It's just that they are um, sort of reaching the saturation point. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it, I mean, I, I just feel like we we need something where we can look at these things more clearly in terms of the results, rather than just trying to make sense of trends. If that makes sense. Yeah. I think, you know, related to that, is part of the problem here almost a lack of the theory about what we expect to, like, I know, like, in your work, in Carl's work, you have very clear theory about, that's why you're measuring null space and task space variability, whereas, I guess one of the theories in this could be that there's such thing as general perceptual abilities, perceptual motor abilities that are going to predict, like, if I have good reaction time, it's going to make me learn motor tasks better. Um, but it sounds like there's not, there's kind of not a lot of theory about what they have. It's just kind of a random selection of variables almost. It, yeah. It, I mean, just to, to some extent, again, I, I, um, again, I'll speak for myself. I, I, um, I think it's, you know, theory and data kind of have to mm-hmm. be circular to some extent, right? So you, you, you find something <laughs> that's consistent, then you have to have, you know, your theory has to explain that, phenomenon type of thing. So I'm not, I, I don't think at least against ex- sort of exploring what's what's going on. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of, for example, the variability, motor variability prediction that those are, you know, heavily tied to this idea of reinforcement learning and mm-hmm. exploration being one of the reasons why you get faster learning mm-hmm. if you have more variability, that kind of thing. So so I think there, there was a fair degree, uh, certainly when you get to things like brain regions, um, then I don't think we have theories yet about why certain mm-hmm. you know areas are doing what they are. And so I think that's where it's sort of like to some degree, I'm okay with that in terms of building that link where you could say, well, this area seems to be pretty responsible because it correlates everywhere, that kind of stuff. So I'm I, I yeah, I, I see your point in terms of theory being important, but to me it's more like what if we look at all this work what should a theory explain and mm-hmm. to me that's not clear which is what worries me more than the fact that 
we don't have a theory going in. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I get your point. It, it is like a, a question that really could be data driven really easily. Like, like right. uh, you can go back in, in sports examples, like, you know, the, the, they have the data in, in like, uh, although it's not for learning, like the, 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 like the combine in the NFL where they're measuring all these general abilities and right. you see how well you do. That's not so much lear motor learning, though, is it? But you, you could, if somehow we standardize a battery of tests, like even you gave kids, you know, and then it, 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 there'd be so much easy to just keep collecting a massive amount of data and then right. generate, you know, you're right, maybe finding out what, what the kind of relationships are then making sense of it might be the, the way to go. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and it's sort of like, I, I didn't know about this paper at that time I, I wrote it, but this uh, new nature paper that came out, I think like two weeks ago or something, mm -hmm. they, they, they pretty much did the same thing. We're looking at, you know, these sort of brain, brain wide association studies, which are also correlations between mm -hmm. you know, some things that happen in the brain versus some behavioral uh, things. And, and, and they found like, you know, this sort of thing, like, you know, typically sample sizes tend to be around like two dozen there and, and mm -hmm. there the correlate, you know, like since they had lots of data, they could have, you know, sort of almost try and simulate what would happen if they had only gotten 20 of those or, you know, and, and sort of recreate these artificial studies. And um, the smaller the sample sizes got, the, you know, the correlations could go either way. So, you know, sometimes it's positively correlated, sometimes negatively correlated. And, you know, you almost had to get in like, I think they said in like the thousands before the correlations kind of settle down. And, and this is where I think like if, if we had to do something like that with a thousand subjects for motor learning, that's, that's outside the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the capability of most folks. I don't want to sure. say all, but you know, maybe there's somebody out there, but you know, it's just outside the capability of most folks to do anything along sort of with that sort of sample size magnitudes. And so, if if we were to even know whether our correlations are robust, we would need that kind of data to say, you know, whether that's the case. And that's why I think the standardization is, you know, have, is going to have to come at some point in terms of establishing, you know, at least for certain types of questions, the the sample sizes that are that are necessary for those questions. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a good point, and I think, and, and it remind me of another, I think, point you made in this article, I guess related to all this, is that a lot of this is one session learning, right? <laughs> one hour. Uh, yeah. It's not studying, like, true coordination or long-term learning. It's one, one hour of pressing keys or moving a cursor or something, right? Yeah. So, which is another. And, and, and that's, I think, yeah. even in the, the old work, um, I think it's Fleischmann's work where where he talks about these individual differences sort of going through stages, right? There's sort of this initial phase where you're relying on certain types of, um, I think he called it verbal cognitive or something along those lines. I, I don't I forget the exact term, but, but early on in learning, you're reliant on a different set of attributes to learn. And so there you, you potentially see a lot more correlations. Mm -hmm. But as you sort of reach that extended phase where you're no longer using those same strategies, um, he suggests that it sort of shifts to, you know, you, you lose those correlations as you go further on because now you're in this sort of very task-specific set of mm -hmm. uh, coordination patterns or whatever you want to call it, that it, it doesn't matter anymore. And, and again, to address that type of question, uh, now you multiply that sample size by <laughs> the number of sessions. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> draw it's... people dropping out, and yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> right. yeah, that's a you know, you know, you do them. Uh, yeah, if you've never done them, motor learning studies are uh, <laughs> not easy, right? There for an, right. especially in that you know the parameters that we have to work under. Um, but yeah, I know I you know I think I think that also kind of relates to you know a point I think. The probably the the higher level a person like the issue though they're not the you know the higher up a person gets into their skill level probably the predictor are not going to be as strong like it's going to predict right. gross differences at the start um, yeah. and very probably better than the fine things <laughs> when we get to the higher level yeah the you know and it, 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 not surprising there's a bunch of factors there right there's not much improvement going on there in the first place to find. You know, I always say you can't have 
uh, covariance without variance, right? <laughs> if you're not changing very much, you're not going to find the things that cause the change very easily. Um, but yeah, so I think that, you know, yeah, the, so this is kind of a, I think it's both an interesting specific question, but it highlights like we've been talking about some general um, issues. So what would be, you know, is there, do you think there's any, I don't, doesn't, that we're at, we're at a stage where we can apply this in any meaningful way. I think it sounds like for me, the, the what your message would be, you know, is come out with a standard way of start measuring a bunch of factors. And, you know, if you were, if you had a training facility where you're starting, you know, give people a test battery and just see what happens, <laughs> try to correlate and, and kind of do a data driven approach first. What, what Would that be kind of your message for? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think that, I mean, we, we sort of had, sort of four big mm. suggestions for, I guess, the field as a whole. Mm. Um, the first one, of course, is this kind of pre-registration, right? So just try and be more transparent in how you defined, you know, going ahead in time, what what what's your independent variable that you used to predict, what's your dependent variable that you would call learning, et cetera. Just to sort of get a sense for, okay, you know, this is stuff that is transparent and they, they reported it early on and that's why they're running that correlation as opposed to, you know, this is one correlation out of, you know, a hundred they could have done. And, but this is the one that turned out to be significant, right? There's a huge difference in mm-hmm. you know, presenting those, those two results. Um, the second one, I think, you know, we, we've talked about is just, you know, it's sort of like the least, uh, you know, theoretically driven or anything like that, but it's sort of like the most important to do is just sort of run bigger sample sizes, right? I mean, there's there's not, we, we can't get away from that. I, I mean, even in lab tasks, which are homogeneous and all, you know, these, most of these were, you know, laboratory type tasks and and you still get that same same kind of result, which means it's, <coughs> um, you know, the, the lab task argument does not rescue the sample size mm-hmm. uh, you know, suggestion, I think. Um, the third one, I think, is, is sort of the, the time scale, right? We, we Going back to this idea of, you know, do we really want motor learning to be everything that people do in a single day? I mean, part of it, I think, is some of the things you've talked about in terms of what about things like acquiring new coordination patterns and so on. But the other one is, you know, is almost more of a, like, you know, you run motor learning studies. Sometimes you know the person who's walking in, and you know how they're gonna do because mm-hmm. whatever they just you know they're mm-hmm. you know double parked while they're coming in for their retention test or whatever. It right. Is, right. Yeah. There's this all these sort of temporary things that can just throw everything out, you know, or or create these you know spurious well, correlations within a day. Right. Yeah. To show correlations that last over longer time spans, to me, suggests something that is much more, you know unrelated to these these nuisance nuisance variables so mm. um, I, I think increasing the time scale even in tasks that are say you know quote unquote short-term learning adaptation types of tasks I think still has some some benefit there um, mm-hmm. and I guess I guess assuming that you're not like reaching plateaus within the first 10 trials then there's like you know I guess no real argument there but uh, even for some of these other types of tasks where, you know, maybe there's there's still some learning even in day two or day three. Um, I think it's it's helpful to have. I think the, the if, I, if I remember right, the maximum we had found was was seven days of learning ahead. Okay. They, they predicted, which is like one study out of, I think, the 40 odd studies we reviewed. So um, it, I think we need more studies on, in at least that range, right, where we're getting something along a week. Would be would be nice to show that you know you can measure something at baseline that predicts how well they do mm-hmm. one later. Yeah. And then the last one, you know, I think again we talked about the idea of broadening the tasks while also maintaining some rigor about the task, so that it's not just you know broadening for the sake of broadening, but broadening with some kind of uh, way of also standardizing, so that you can. You know, you can have, like I said, maybe four or five different tasks, but those five different tasks have well-defined parameters that everybody can use um, and run the experiments. Yeah, no, that that's really, and I, your third one there made me think of, a, you know, there's kind of, I think when we do motor learning, and even when we do 
skill level comparisons, like when people do a study of working memory and elite athletes versus non-athletes, I think we all recognize there's these kind of overarching individual constraints or um, like motivation, focus, right. all these things, and which are, we recognize they're important, but I think in our studies, we almost kind of want to take them out of this equation because <laughs> that's not where we're really, like the, they affect everything broadly. Uh, we want right. a bit more specificity on what makes you learn the movement tests better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's, that's the kind of factor that we don't want in the, in the mm. predictor. Right? I mean, that's yeah. sort of, we, we in, it, I agree in some ways they are important, uh, but you know, you could also think about them as more of a, a performance variable. Yeah. In some cases at least. Yeah. Um, and your, so, your point that, it, you know, if you just do one session, the chance of, Someone what those and someone being tired or whatever, right. <laughs> you know, it's they, a, they it's, didn't have their coffee that day, or, yeah, you know, whatever it is, yeah. All those things can suddenly play a big role in how how well they're doing. And so, I mean, if you're doing correlations, then you know some of those could just be sort of these nuisance variables that creep in. Yeah, yeah. We used to I admit, you know, we used to do these psychophysics experiments where there's like 250 trials and we used to, we were up, up subjects and other people, other grad students experiments. And, you know, you'd, some, you'd start off bad and then you tell the person, go have a cup of coffee, and come back. Right. Um, because it required a lot of being, you know, sustained attention. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think that's, you know, with all along with the, you know, the issues, other issues, that that's a good one. So, yeah, so I, as I said, I think I think this is a that's a really interesting question, and I is it I didn't um, so this you're, this is uh, is it in the the special issue on individual? It was there, I think it was human movement science or someone had a special. No, issue. no, yeah. um, this this was I mean the um, the we cited a paper that came out in the oh, okay. issue. I think mm -hmm. Anderson and colleagues they did a they did a beautiful review of the full history of individual differences, mm -hmm. so it was really nice. This was more, I mean, like I said, we, we still hasn't sort of made it through the peer review, so it's still a preprint. Okay. Right now. Um, but uh, we're hoping we'll we'll see it out. And yeah, sometime. yeah, I think it's like <laughs> individual differences is, is something every how X number of years, say 10, we come out and say, it's really important, we need to study it, we need to know more, and then we never really <laughs> get yeah. much I mean, further. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I totally agree, right? I mean, sort of it It makes sense to be able to do that in a whole lot of contexts, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, like, again, if you go to the sports example or, or, mm -hmm. or a therapy example, mm -hmm. if I know what this person's going to do over the next whatever X weeks, then it gives me a huge mm -hmm. advantage in terms of like how I should structure practice in some way, right? Maybe... Uh, it's not necessarily like you, know, you give up on the person, but you know your ability to say tailor your practice schedule to someone who you think may improve more or less certainly plays a big, big role. And and then we always talk about this idea of of challenge points, right? So again, mm -hmm. if you can predict these things ahead of time, that okay, yeah, this person's going to reach a pretty high level, then presumably you can tailor all that and you know sort of make it much more, uh, you know. My pra make practice much more efficient uh, compared mm -hmm. to what you would do if you just did the same thing for everybody. But uh, identifying these is, <laughs> is not trivial. No. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I agree. And I think, you know, you could bring the idea like a rate limiter, you know, if you could identify something that predicts learning and maybe we could strengthen that thing <laughs> before right. Right. along with training you. Uh, yeah. In some cases, depending on what it is, yeah. Right. But right. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's a really it, it's one of those every coach and every trainer and every physiotherapist recognizes. Right. Um, but it's yeah, it's not an easy uh, thing to study. <laughs> and, you no, know, so um, yeah. So thank you. We'll look for it to to come out, uh, and I'll, I'll post a link when it when it does. But thank you very much for for discussing with me. All right. Thanks again, Rob. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.